Hello, and once again, a very warm welcome to The Change Exchange, where my guest today is Susanne Forsluer, South Africa's first female heart surgeon. And she operates mainly on children, huh, Susanne? That is correct, yes. How did you get into medicine in the first place? What did you want to be when you were a little girl? I think even as a small child, I, I always wanted to do medicine. My, my father was a doctor and he was uh, specialized in orthopedic surgery. Um, sometimes I think he would have liked me to do orthopedic surgery because he always used to say, you don't really have to be strong, you just need to know how to hmm. do something because he was fairly um, small. And then, um, so I would say since I was a child, I always wanted to do medicine. Why, what was your, what did your father symbolize, if I can say, put it like that. What did you think? What did the doctor do? I think I used to go with him always. I mean, on a weekend when he went to the hospital, I used to go with him. I used to walk with him. He used to explain things to me. And he was always, it, it just appealed to me, I think. Um, it looked like he was always doing something good, good for his, <laughs> his patients. The nurses liked him his colleagues liked him, yeah. and he always enjoyed what he was doing. We as kids saw quite little of him because he was working um, quite long hours, but I think he did set the, the example that I, I probably followed. And then how and when did you decide heart surgery? I, I didn't really decide that initially. When, when I was 10, at the first transplant was done by Professor Barnard and we were, I remember it so well, we were in Mossel Bay having a December holiday when the news came and every next news bulletin we would switch the radio on, listen to the progress and at that stage I had no idea that I would do that one day and over time when I started doing medicine I quite liked surgery I used to do a lot of sewing when I was at school. I used to make all my own clothes. I, I quite like practical sewing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, crochet or, or anything like that. If I made something, I made something that is useful and I used to wear all the clothes I made. And maybe that played a role and during Oh, I thought you meant you liked sewing up after the, the doctor had done the operation. Yes, well, <laughs> that I also did. I also did. I think at at at, at university, uh, we we uh, rotated through all the different specialties, and some things you you know you find more interesting than other others. And I always thought in surgery you need to be a bit of a physician. You need to be a bit of a pediatrician. And, um, and that's what I really liked most. Can you remember the first time that you actually held the scalpel? You know, as, as students, in, in, I studied at Free State University. As, as students, we did a lot. Um, first, not so much cutting or, or using the scalpel, but we used to work in the trauma unit and we used to suture a lot. In other words, you know, in those days were more knives than guns, so there was a lot of lacerations, car accidents and so on. It was all very exciting and quite rewarding. Um, so we had a lot of practical experience as students. I think for starting to actually do procedures, that really came later. Mm -hmm. But one had many opportunities of being uh, involved in, in surgery and assisting the prime primary surgeon, even as students. I think my f the first operations we really did that were at all meaningful was cesarean sections. And sometimes 25 babies were born a night if you were on duty and a few were cesareans. And that's the really, I think the first relatively major surgery any student uh, does. When did your interest shift to children? Um, that came later. When I was at university, I wanted to do surgery. At the time, I thought I would do vascular surgery because it's really clean and neat and, um, and, uh, um, and, and 
the results, it always looked so beautiful to me. And when I went, I went to Johannesburg and as part of the first year of training in surgery, I rotated through cardiac surgery. Where was uh, this? At Barrow? At, no, at that stage it was at the hospital called J.G. Stradom mm. in those days. It's now I Helen think Joseph. It, it's now called Helen Joseph mm. and Rob Kingsley was the surgeon there. I was very lucky as a very junior um, trainee to get many opportunities to do things. So I would like open and close the chest and put the patient on bypass and so on. And I quite liked that. And he, he said, if you like vascular surgery, why don't you rather do cardiac surgery? And then I thought, well, that may be, may be quite interesting because in those days, it was very common to do coronary artery bypass surgery. It was the most common operation in the world. Today, it's, it's far less. And that's basically suturing small vessels uh, to each other. And, um, is that what vascular surgery is? Vascular surgery, but it's vascular... Blood vessels. Blood vessels. Vascular mm. surgery is, blood ve uh, is connecting blood vessels or not mm. connecting or working with blood vessels. So, for instance, when you have an abnormal blood vessel like an aneurysm, that's like a ballooning of mm. a vessel, uh, the surgery to repair that is vascular mm. surgery. When, when there are blockages, in any uh, um, um, vessels like to the legs or to other organs and also in the heart which is, is what we used to do then it's vascular surgery to use a vascular grafts like in those days we used veins from the legs and then connected the vein before and after the narrowings and that is why it's called bypass surgery so what is it like to stand there looking at someone's heart beating? Um, I, I cannot, you know. Does I, one get used to it? I, I, I think you do. Um, you do not really, I, d I don't think you really see the heart beating um, as such. Um, one's more focused on what the abnormality is that you need to address and what are the precautions that you need to take that when you correct the abnormality, that the organ function is still normal or, uh, or adequate to maintain the circulation. So you train yourself to look at it almost technically. You do, you do yeah. actually, but you do also have to keep in mind that this structure belongs to an individual and that whatever procedure one does can potentially harm an individual or it, it will give enough of an insult for someone to recover from once everything's been corrected. It's not like you correct something and it's all done. It's just these wounds that need to heal and so on. Those things um, take time. So tell me about deciding on children. At the end of, of, of that year, I came to Cape Town. And when I arrived in Cape Town, I was first placed at Red Cross and somehow for most of my training I spent a fair uh, amount of time at Red Cross and I found it very interesting. In our days we were very lucky that we did a lot of operating. We were allowed to do quite a lot so that by the time we were uh, finished with our training we could actually do the work. Nowadays I think with the lack of resources and so on, the numbers of, of cases have reduced a lot and many trainees finish their training with limited practical experience, which we were lucky um, that we were in, the, in, that, in that period. Is a child as a patient different in your experience of it from an adult? Yes, a child's very different. A child it's, it's a little bit, a child cannot communicate always. A small baby cannot communicate. A child has difficulty expressing how they feel and sometimes if they are scared, they don't have a way of showing it. The other major difference between adults and children is that you interact with an adult patient. So you interact 
primarily with the patient and the family is in a way, if one can say so, secondary. Mm. With children you interact with the parents and often also with grandparents. So a lot of the care of, of children is really your communication with the family and also supporting them in times that they find traumatic or stressful. The child is, is, is not your, your primary uh, contact. Does the fact that you are a woman make it easier, do you think? In some ways it does. Um, I think people do perceive women as more sympathetic and I think the, it's easier maybe to relate to parents. On the other hand, people are sometimes surprised that the women actually can do their, their work. So, so it, 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 it cuts both, both ways. Have you found that it is still a man's world? I mean, the first female heart surgeon. Um, I, never actually, I never actually felt it while I was training because I was never shy to work. I, I had some male colleagues who were like leaving at you know, at the first opportunity. So I was always prepared to, to work. And so from that, from that aspect, I did, not feel, um, I did not feel at all threatened. It actually was, I was prepared to do that. Um, as, I, uh, as I grew older, um, you, start meeting, um, you start meeting more resistance. Um, I, for instance, I was planning to stay in academic medicine. It was like I really loved it and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the work. And but I never wanted to be the head of the department. So I didn't want to be a manager. So I never had that sort of aspirations. But I did have experiences where the person who then becomes the head of the department is like your peer and they make life difficult for you. So in the end it, it became rather unpleasant and I actually left academic medicine and went into practice. Which and was, you think that that was because you are a woman? I, I cannot say. I mean, it may yeah. be other factors, but mm -hmm. I, I cannot say my male colleagues were treated the same way. And I also can't say that I would have allowed my male treat, colleagues to be treated the way I was treated at that time. And it, it made a, it, it did make a, a difference in how you know you decide what to do forward, but like like any setback, the, it, there's more opportunities in setbacks than than disadvantages. So I where think. did you go? Initially, I had a part-time appointment, and I went to into practice in Cape Town at the then called City Park Hospital, and that's where I I still am. City, what city? nearly 30 years later. Did you yeah. ever meet Professor Barnard? Yes, I met, I met Professor Barnard many times. Um, I, I, I did not meet him while I was um, studying. When I started in 1984 at Groeteskir Red Cross Hospital was the year after he retired. At that time he went to the United States to Oklahoma and he came back around 1988 when I had already finished my training. Um, that's when we met and we had quite a friendship in his post-retirement phase. Mm. Um, he had a foundation in Austria, a Chris Barnard Foundation, and he brought kids from Eastern Europe and Russia here under um, uh, as part of the charity work of his mm -hmm. foundation. I did the operation so he brought the kids and it was great fun and he used to be quite involved um, in um, the organ donor foundation in the middle, well actually in the 90s um, I was very involved with uh, organ donor foundation and we used to have um, some events and I, uh, he was always kind enough to participate and be the guest speaker and he drew the he definitely yeah. drew interest and it helped a lot to raise funds for for a good cause. So he would it lend was, that that star quality. Uh, and, more than that he was yeah. absolutely he was wonderful with things like that and he was a, a wonderful uh, personality a great sense of humor I'm sure you also 
also met him, never but did, never no. did. What a pity. He was yeah. absolutely wonderful. He could relate to anybody. He could be kind to anybody. There were a lot of anecdotes while he was working that he was sometimes difficult to work with, but it's not something I ever mm. experienced. You've also allowed television cameras into your operating theater and into the whole process of finding the donor, connecting with the family, uh, putting that together, which is a deeply emotional thing. How did you experience that? Anton's cousin um, has a, and his partner has a film production company and they did a various uh, documentary um, programs and they wanted some years ago to do a documentary um, on transplantation and at the time we had a brother and sister, it was in the early 2000s, a brother and sister who were both waiting for heart transplants. And they did a program about them and they had a lot of, the program is actually not involving us or being in theatre at all. Um, they, used to, they used to visit the family, mm. spoke to them how they felt and they did this program uh, which, which then covered the journeys of these children. And n more recently, um, they asked if they could do something like, like that again, and we agreed to do that. So uh, very little of the actual program involves cameras in theater, and because they are quite discreet, mm -hmm. and because they are there without you, in a way, knowing they are there. So they would be there, but when you work, it's, 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 it's quite focused. Mm -hmm. So we don't really interact much with people in the room when we're doing the work. But of course, if we finished, we would speak to them, give a bit of information mm -hmm. and so on. And I think the program has been, they've been quite satisfied with it, but my role is fairly small and they haven't been invasive at all or disrupting yeah. anything. Yeah, it so depends on yeah. attitudes and so forth, no? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And we're used to people in our theatres. We often have students, mm -hmm. colleagues coming. I, I, sometimes it feels, it feels like there are a bit too many people around, but it is our way of um, sharing what we are, are doing. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, it's no problem to, in a way, I wouldn't say ignore them, but that's exactly what carry, I do. Carry on with but what I, you're doing. I, yeah. I just say beforehand that we can say, we can show this and this is what everyone does, and you're welcome to ask questions. But once we work, I don't want to actually, I don't want movement in the, uh, you know, in the, in the, in your, you know, sort of your visual field, because it's quite disturbing, and people then know maybe we ask questions afterwards. Mm. We have a way that we allow people, but we don't let it affect what we are are doing. Your husband Anton is uh, an anaesthetist. Yes. Where did you meet, and when did you decide that this was a partnership that could be more than professional? We met in um, we met in nineteen. 82. Um, I, I was working in Bloemfontein where I studied and I was working in intensive care. In those days were the early days of intensive care and I, after my year of doing that, my professor offered me to come to a conference in Cape Town. At that time Anton was working in Johannesburg and he came to the same conference and we met at this conference. Um, he, he was born and bred Cape Townian. He went, was born, went to school, went to university and traveled a lot uh, before and during his um, time that he specialized. He, he was interested in cardiac anesthesia. Um, in those days, um, uh, he went to uh, work in Johannesburg because there were opportunities for him. And that's the same time as I went to Johannesburg to start surgical training. And somehow during that year, we, we sort of got to know each other. And at the end of the year, he came back to Cape Town and uh, asked me if I would like to come with. I must say I was a bit, I wasn't certain at the time, but I thought, 
why not? And <laughs> you say, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, then it's just one of those things. So, and I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. What is it like to, to work together and then share the rest of your life? Although we work together, it's not like there is a personal relationship at work. Mm. Um, at work, we, I have my uh, responsibilities and he or his partner, who also work with me, um, have, have their responsibilities. Mm. So if, if I have to think last week or even yesterday, who was my anesthetist, I wouldn't know because they, they have their own roles to mm. play. Where it's, where it's helpful is, for instance, um, when you, um, if I go away sometimes, I often, I'm often out of town, often, often sometimes out of town, then at least I can, um, my, my phone is always diverted to him if I cannot answer for any reason. So it's a nice mm. backup to have. So at least mm. even if, if anything happens or somebody rings me or so, it's never that the phone goes unanswered. So from mm. that point of view, the, 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 the professional relationship is very useful. Um, I, we, um, and it also helps to understand that you sometimes the days are a bit long, sometimes you come late, but it works, works both ways. How does one keep the relationship um, fresh and solid if you both work such long days and you have such busy lives? Yeah, we, we do, but we do, we, um, I think it's, a, it's just the way, it way things happen. Um, we, oft, we go home in the evening, we often go out in the evening, maybe we'll have a meal together, we'll do something with um, the children, or um, when the kids were small they used to go to my mother for one evening a week, and, and we just make time mm. to do something um, That's that we enjoy. That's quite a practical thing, one yes. needs to actually make time. Yes. We always, when the kids were small, we thought that one night a week we will definitely see all our friends and pick up all the social connections, but you actually don't do it because sometimes when the kids are small, they so dominate everything that you're often quite happy just to go home and actually have an uninterrupted <laughs> conversation. And tell me about the kids. Are you thought that you would never have children of your own. Yes, I thought mm. so. When, when I was 40, I, saw, I, I thought, you know, maybe you've just missed the, uh, missed the boat. And then I went... Um, did you try? Did you... Uh, no, I, did, I didn't actually do anything. Really. I, mm. I thought it, it'll happen or it won't happen. But when I hit 40, I thought I was a bit disappointed. Mm. And, um, and then we discussed it and then I went to see somebody and went through 13 attempts to, of, of treatment, which is quite traumatic because every disappointment affects you uh, a little bit, but it helps if you can just go again, then it doesn't, it's not, it's just trying again. But then after 13 times and a few serious complications, you know, it was the time came to, to call it a day. And then we were extremely fortunate my brother had two boys, they were at the time sort of seven to nine years old, and his, his wife, um, um, and we had a little, she came and she offered to be a surrogate mother, and we Did were, it just come from her? Yes, I, 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 I was very surprised because she's a non-medical person, and, um, and I never even considered that. We sort of did think of adoption, but Anton wasn't keen on that because he knew people that adopted kids and they were not happy, you know, they, it didn't work out so well. I knew people that adopted kids and they were extremely happy, so I was quite comfortable with that. He wasn't, and then somehow in conversation, this came up. Um, we discussed it with the, uh, uh, the, the clinic, or the, the, our, our colleagues who were uh, specialized in that, and they thought it was a good idea, and it worked the first time. So we were very uh, fortunate and privileged to do that. Can um, you remember holding your girls for the first time? Yes, we, we actually, we, when they were born, they, were, they lived in Johannesburg and um, 
we, I went always when there was an antenatal uh, visit, we went together. And when it was uh, towards the end of the pregnancy, uh, she came to Cape Town and she was at the time studying for exams, so was was quite uh, was uh, good to sort of take time off work and and study. And the kids were born in Cape Town. Um, they were delivered by a, a very good friend of Anton, whose child is his godchild. And we decided beforehand he was going to take the first baby and I was going to take the next one. So we actually could hold them at the, when they were born. My brother was there to support his wife. And for us, it's been, a, it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. How did they change your life, if at all? Well, they did. They do change. Yes. They do change your life. I think the logistics of normal practice uh, with unpredictable working hours was challenging. Um, I always had somebody for the kids, so I had somebody, in a way, to uh, represent me at all times. My my mother, my mother. I have a brother. My brother and sister are twins, and my mother offered to come and look after them for the first three months. So in, the, in that time, I worked a little bit less, and, um, and she was there. So I came home earlier and, and um, spent a bit more time at home. And since then, they had an au pair for the first year or two. And then they had a girl for more or less from the, when they were two years old until they finished primary school. The same, the same um, girl looked after them and she was wonderful and she used to do everything what a mother would do in terms of running around, feeding, dressing and so on. And we just had the pleasure of their <laughs> company and, and, and that, was, that was great. And now they're 16. They're 16. When they, when they finished primary school and, and I said, you can't have an au pair until you get married. <laughs> They were fairly disappointed in the, the first few months of like planning and, and, um, and not having somebody at your service was a bit of an adjustment, but they've actually adjusted extremely well and they, they fairly, they're very independent and they, um, they're great company. Um, we, we enjoy every, every minute of it. And tell me something about your home. You lived in a in an apartment for the first while, first time a part of their lives, and then you you chose to go and live in a home. What yes. what attracted you? What sold that house to you? We our house. We live in a house which we had long before the kids were born. Um, the, uh, where we live in Cape Town, uh, uh, in Greenpoint, it's a little against the hill, so the houses there have steps. And when the kids were born. Um, I, I, also, uh, I bought an apartment in the waterfront, which was just developing at the time, and that was on one level. So uh, uh, we chose where we live to live close to where we work. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the nature of the work we do is such that you'd, you cannot really be far away, mm -hmm. because any time anything unforeseen can happen, sometimes one just wants to make a little uh, visit and you it, it's not like you want to travel 20 minutes half an hour late in the evening just to see that everything's okay so we chose homes close to where we're working mm -hmm. which today we're very grateful because the traffic has become an absolute nightmare so we when the kids were born we lived in our house and we then when they were about a year old when they started walking this apartment was finished and we went to live there for four years and they started to walk and swim and so on and then one day we decided now we're moving back to our house and we've been there ever since. What's the best thing about that house? The house, I think the views, I mean we have magnificent views over Millie Point, the new Cape Town Stadium, the waterfront, Robben Island and the other major attraction is that it, it faces north, um, and mm. we, it, in, in winter time it's nice and sunny, in summer time it's cool enough. Um, and but the major attraction is the convenience, being you know not having to spend too much time on the road and travelling. Susan, thanks so much for making time. Thank it's you. in the middle of the day. I know that it's it's a it's a special concession. 
So thank you. I so enjoyed it. <laughs> thank <laughs> you very much. Thanks. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>